Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Platt with the Washington chapter of the Society for Range Management, and this is the third uh, quarterly presentation we have hosted uh, this year. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Ken Visser, who retired after a 37-year career as a range man, rangeland management specialist uh, with BLM. Uh, and today, his topic is a historical overview of the BLM and public lands, livestock grazing from the Civil War uh, to now. And Ken has uh, is going to give some background on how this top topic originated. And Ken, thank you very much for sharing your experience and knowledge with us today. Uh, do we have do we have anyone who's not from Washington? Generally, me. Okay. Ken, have you met have you met Andrea? She's yeah. Uh, yeah, at the meeting. Yeah, yeah, good. I'm a war I again. I live now. in Washington now, but she spent a lot of her career in Washington. That's true. Well, I've, I've, this talk has has <laughs> only tangentially affects Washington, so no uh, worries. If, if we're ready to go, and I also told Tom that usually. Um, when I used to teach it at the range, the BLM's range school in Phoenix, it would be a, a real long slog. There'd be questions and all that. I'll try to get as much in as I can, but it may be that this is a uh, a two part talk. And, and those of you who want to see part two will have to go into the next quarterly meeting. <laughs> or, so with that, I guess should I share my screen, Tom, and then go? Oh uh, yeah. And I, because I'm trying to get used to this. Okay, Ken, you have to, it says you're screening, you're sharing. That's right, you got it. And this isn't where I want to be. Okay, the title of this talk is the uh, historical overview of the BLM and public livestock, public lands, livestock grazing administration. Uh, you'll see from this, I don't know how to hide my. Anyway, you're fine, Ken. How to hide that top part? But anyway, uh, no, it, it it just lets us know you're sharing your screen. <laughs> okay. You can see the logos from the grazing service in when it first started in uh, the early 1930s to the 1950s BLM logo and the 70s through 80s BLM logo and the current BLM logo. So that actually that little bit right there sort of tells you a little bit already about the BLM. But before we go there, let's start off with a little history. Um, the BLM actually is a combination of the General Land Office and the Grazing Service. And the General Land Office was established in 1812 and was housed in several different departments of the government. The point of it was to primarily dispose of lands that had been uh, give, give to uh, Revolutionary War soldiers uh, uh, lands and um, and to settle, settle going west. All the um, colonies as part of joining the Union had to cede their uh, lands, become part of the United States, the lands that they claimed. And I was told by a BLM realty specialist that, for example, the state of Virginia or the colony of Virginia claimed all lands to the west to the Pacific Ocean. But in order to get into the um, United States, they sort of had to, to say, we, uh, uh, we, we make no further claims to these lands past a certain point. So there is the territory of the original 13 states and how the manifest destiny of the United States and the dates that went along with it. Um, you can see the last country that we actually got was probably the Gadsden Purchase in 1853. 
So uh, in the Western states. Um, from there, my focus of my talk is gonna be where I got my cursor and that's in the 11 Western states, those being um, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, Nevada, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, and California. Here's an old map. I really like these old maps. This is pre-states. This is, uh, for example, if you look up here, the only thing they got going in Oregon is Oregon City and where I live, Fort Vancouver. There is no Seattle. <laughs> anyway, as far as the Western development of grazing, in the 1880s to the 1870s, it was pretty much a free for all. Uh, free, no one, um, there was no limits on what could be uh, done or taken out in, in what the public domain lands, what they were called. Um, trying, uh, I don't have numbers on my slides, so. There were, there were two homestead acts during this time, and also the general mining law of 1872 was passed during this time. But um, these early, the early Western laws at this time used first and first and right first in time first and right custom of the of the frontier. And that was for a variety of things. You get there first, you get it. Okay. After the Civil War, and um, before we go to that, right now I'd like to this. I took this talk from. The person who gives it now and sort of abbreviated it, and he hasn't updated the public land statistics since 2014, but it's been pretty stable since, I would say, the early 1980s with respect to how many animal unit months are have been billed and sold um, by the Bureau of Land Management. And I don't have the figures for the U.S. Forest Service, but I think that they're uh, the number of permits that the Forest Service issues is around 6,200. So I think their number of AUMs they sell is quite a bit fewer than this, quite a bit less. Now let's go back to where we go back to the origin. So now this 11th state livestock population, 1870, these figures I got when I was doing my research for the Justice Department and our defense of uh, Public Lands Council versus Babbitt, that which was a challenge to the grazing regulations and was in the late 90s, was that back in the uh, Library of Congress and in the archives, there are uh, bureau, there was a Bureau of Economic Statistics, and they had, they based these numbers off of um, tax rolls, there would be taxes on the livestock that the states would collect. And this would be uh, collated annually and reported. And I went through all these charts for these times and, and added up all the animals and then multiply that by uh, time in order to get uh, animal unit months. So in 1870, we had 1.1 million cattle and 4.1 million sheep. A lot of the cattle came from Texas. Uh, they didn't suffer as much during uh, the, the Civil War with respect to, you know, having their herds uh, decimated or also uh, being used to feed um, uh, Union troops. Um, the, these herds were driven from like shipping points in Kansas. Uh, west and north um, from, well, to the vast open ranges of the west and north. This wasn't a problem for the United States government because it helped uh, supplant the buffalo and this helped with the official policy of subjugating the uh, uh, indigenous populations of, of the Indians. During this time, it was a uh, 
free for all and led to industrial strength overstocking and deterioration of the range. Uh, the, a lot of this um, stocking, as I noted on the earlier slide, was due to um, eastern eastern banks and investment and, and investors would uh, fund, you know, livestock herds and then take the, take the profits as well. And so that was the big money for <clears throat> anyway for the for the livestock. But um, since it got so crowded, and this is since it got so crowded, uh, there was naturally tension that occurred, and uh, this is well documented by <clears throat> and dramatized in uh, various movies uh, over the years. And uh, my under my reading of uh, the history of it is that a lot of this stuff is was not that exaggerated with respect to how much violence occurred. Uh, when it came to conflicts between um, ranchers and settlers and ranchers and uh, or cattlemen and sheepmen. So in the 1880s, now we're up to a Western livestock population of uh, four, almost 15 million sheep and 3.9 million cattle, which adds up to being around 80 million AUMs coming off this public domain lands in the 11 Western states. And around, you have to understand also at this time, there was no system where, or the, it wasn't a popular system to have uh, a ranch put up hay and feed your, put up hay to feed your cattle over the winter. What it was, what the system was, was to keep your livestock out there, gather them to, it, it, at shipping times, divide them up, um, um, you know, by brands, et cetera, and then um, rinse and repeat as the as the years went by. So, in um, this slide illustrates the uh, Johnson County cattle barons who were uh, upset with uh, the sheep people because the sheep people. Um, had no um, permanent base and they would come in and take uh, forage that the cattle people were, were relying on. So if you're holding back on your spring forage and the next thing you know, a large herd of sheep comes through and it's gone, that, is, that is, was bad for you and they, they uh, in, enforced what they believed to be their rights. So, um, Speaking from the slides here. So, in uh, well, barbed wire was actually invented in France. That's usually the the the, uh, <laughs> the little factoid I like to relate on this particular one, but. As time went on, more and more uh, ranchers were uh, starting to fence the range and fence off what they felt were uh, the boundaries for where they, you know, where they believed they had control. Well, they felt they had rights to grazing in these areas. So over time, barbed wire was uh, a very significant in, in helping control the range. Now, we're up in what well now look at this number uh, in 1890 I seem to be missing it. sorry Well, here we have 136.8 million AUMs being taken off the Western states. This um, picture here is of a land pattern in Northeast Elko County in Nevada. And the gray areas, this right here happens to be the Mary's River drainage. And this, there are all uh, lands that were homesteaded 
by ranchers and or rancher uh, representatives. It wasn't uh, illegal for ranchers to have hired hands to go out and they homesteaded too. And, and they would consolidate all of these private land holdings. The private land holdings were the ones that were where the water was. And this allowed to dominate, and here the yellow are public domain, public domain lands. Um, what had become BLM land. This is what I thought I was missing. Okay, the system of not putting up hay for the winter came to a, a, a great halt, or, or they had to figure out something new to do after the 1886-1887 great die-up. And this happened in uh, uh, northern Montana to uh, southern Colorado. And it was just, there were some uh, crazy, crazy stuff happening, like uh, uh, cattle carcasses uh, piling up uh, enough where they would pile up against fences and other cattle could go over them, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, they, they had a gargantuan uh, great cattle die-off in 1886 and 1887. A similar uh, event in the Great Basin in 1887-89 uh, decimated herds there. So this was uh, starting to become a problem for the depleted ranges now were starting to become a problem for the cattlemen themselves because their uh, herds weren't, um, you know, they weren't feeding enough. They were, they were um, getting, well, I should probably go to my notes. It's been a while since I gave this one and usually I pace around where I talk. Widespread forage depletion reduced stock weights at market. And this was economically damaged to the Western livestock industry. Speculation created boom and bust livestock business cycles. Severe and repeated overgrazing between 1875 and 1900 denuded the watersheds, causing flooding in downstream valleys, leading to local calls for federal action. Constituency concerns with deplorable wastage of the rangeland and declining economics of the livestock industry attracted Congress's attention. The stock industry and the public affected by the flooding were the ones who came to Congress. Congress responds to the issues replaced, raised by constituents, not vice versa. Now, we're at 122.98 million AUMs, and I just, that is just, I, I have to, I want to come back and say when I first joined the BLM, it was in 1979, and the reason I was hired was to become, was to do range survey in, in northern Nevada. And during our range survey, we would use uh, range site descriptions that the NRCS had developed for the area, and it was still, it wasn't this was before state and transition. This was still based on Clementsian uh, concepts. Anyway, there were no Forbes on, on a lot of, there were no Forbes. The, all the NRCS range site descriptions, which they, they make from, um, you know, relic areas and things like that, contained, you know, great descriptions of the grasses and forbs and, and, and shrubs, et cetera. Out, out there, there were, the forbs were absolutely gone. Their grasses were, you know, depauperate and still in 1979, I just kind of wondered, you know, what was going on. And, and now with this kind of grazing pressure on it, it's, um, you can probably tell it was probably, you know, just grazed out by sheep. Crazily, crazily. Hmm. 
this is the, the point of this slide is to indicate that the forests at the time were carved out beginning probably like 20 years earlier, maybe if we have a Forest Service person on, they, they started making forest reserves back in the late 1800s, but they didn't have an agency to administer them until uh, 1905. And once they did have that agency, they started taking action to get control of the grazing problem that they were having on national forests. And national forests also were being denuded by overgrazing uh, severe enough to um, threaten, uh, you know, all soil and erosion through in, in, in downstream reservoirs. And so normal, normal communities were, were um, complaining about what's going on up in the forest and some control I had to bring come, come to bear. The reason for this slide, which I, or this graph, which I found shows what the Forest Service did right around the time, and this is on the Wasatch Plateau, when they came into control. And the question of course is, well, if they weren't on the forest anymore, where, where would they have gone? And it's very likely that where they went was out on the unregulated public domain further adding to the pressure on what would later become BLM lands. So even if, even with the um, uh, development of the Forest Service and organization of the Forest Service, the range problem continued and they were, this, we're talking about public domain lands now and we, they were advancing two different ideas on how to address it, two competing ideas. One was bigger homesteads, um, and the other, because right now, um, homesteads were listed, well, what's this one, 1868, um, 160 acres. Uh, my grand, my great-grandfather homesteaded up in North uh, Central Washington, and I believe they got 40 acres. I saw the, I saw the homestead patent. But anyway, this num that number of acres obviously isn't enough to uh, run an economic livestock operation out in, you know, the sagebrush steppe or the desert country. The second solution proposed in Congress was to do uh, grazing leases, and we know, I mean, if what rudimentary history says the Taylor Grazing Act occurred in or was enacted in 1934. But the concept of grazing leases was not a new concept. And it, this is a grazing districts in 1900 up in um, uh, Crow, Crow Reservation grazing districts in Montana. It's just to illustrate that. The homesteading advocates in 1916, um, the Stock Raising Homestead Act was enacted. And this also uh, allowed for um, stock trailing, which the BLM still allows today, and that's the authority for that. But it allowed 640 acres for entry. And, uh, you know, talk about a rough go. I mean, look at these. You got you to gotta have admiration for the pioneers. Um, what they were willing to come out and, and try and make a go of it. It's amazing. I'm always amazed. So now we're up to 1916 and World War I in Europe. And eventually that of course came to the, uh, the United States eventually joined the war too. At this point, the problems of the range uh, became, took the back burner and um, they, the objective was to great, raise as much cattle as you could to help, you know, feed the troops and to feed Europe, which was, you know, being decimated by World War I. At the same time, uh, Western livestock producers were um, fencing in um, uh, water sources on public lands. They were, you know, they didn't have water rights for them or anything. They were just water sources for their cattle. And 
the point I try to make here is that back then, everybody who was living out in the rural area had livestock. It wasn't just the big livestock producers. You would have um, small, <clears throat> small farmers who had uh, livestock as well, and they also needed water, but they were being prevented from using that water <clears throat> by the more powerful ranchers. And um, in response to that, they, uh, President at the time issued the uh, um, Executive Land Order 107. And if I can get to my notes, this was the well, sometimes I miss my the printout misses my notes sometimes. I'm still working on that. This is a pub, these these uh, this executive order <coughs> established public water reserves, and you'll still run into these public water reserve. Well, they still exist out in out in the western land, and sometimes they're a source of controversy with their management. So in the twenties, now <coughs> the war is over, and the tension can return to. Uh, grazing districts, and I can. I'm seeing. I'm already up to a half hour, so I better speed up a little bit. But this was one of the first concept papers, if you will, on forming grazing districts. And then um, during the uh, there were there were competing ideas uh, to what to do with all these public domain lands and. Um, these ideas uh, involved um, giving it giving it to the states, and they actually did propose this to the western states. And the western states at that time turned them down. They said no. Um, this this is Governor Dern of Utah at the time, and I have a quote that goes along with this um, slide. It says, "This is." The states already own in their school grant lands and their school land grants millions of acres of this same kind of land which they can neither sell nor lease and which is yielding no income. Why should they want more of this pre pre precious heritage of desert? So the idea that somehow that these Western lands should be given back to the states is based on a false notion that it ever belonged to the states in the first place. I bring this up because the BLM still has these struggles. We have, you know, Bundys of the world, and uh, they 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 have some ideas that are just not uh, solidly founded as to what the what the real background is to the public lands. Okay, the final straw was for getting to um, passing of the Taylor Grazing Act was, uh, well, here we have the 1930s, we have the Great Dust Bowl. This is uh, in both of these bottom pictures are in New Mexico. Um, this is a blown, blown dust. This is pretty obvious itself. And things were looking really, really uh, bad for the resources out west. And so now we have um, the evolution of what was to become the Taylor Grazing Act. And so the first bill was from uh, Colton in Utah, but you can see the various um, congressmen uh, proposing bills that had different preambles. I put the preambles on here because um, we'll end up with one that pretty much looks like this. What That's the point of the Taylor Grazing Act. One other note, historical note that I thought was interesting was that 
The Taylor originally proposed a bill that required the state concurrence with federal management plans and practices before they could be implemented. And the federal government said, no, we, 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 we don't buy that. So they removed that and the, the Taylor Grazing Act became a bill to stop injury to the public grazing lands, so forth and so on. So now we have a bunch of states that we're dealing with. So the, the importance of the Taylor Grazing Act is one of the first conservation acts, actually. Um, passed um, the establishment of the Forest Service, but this is to promote the highest use of public lands, pending its final disposal, stop, stop injury on the public lands by preventing overgrazing and soil deterioration, provide for their orderly use, improvement, and development, and to stabilize the livestock industry. Now, depending the final disposal is depending the final disposal is the a kicker right here. The, the government was not at this point in the management of the public domain business. They fully expected that over time, these lands would be given away. And what I didn't talk about in this talk was I, well, I, I took it out, was all the lands that were given to the railroads and the railroad uh, checkerboard situation all across the West in order to develop the West. But they, I think the federal government figured at some point all of these lands were, it, were gonna be <clears throat> turned over to private hands. The first director of the uh, Bureau of Land, uh, the Division of Grazing was Ferry Carpenter. And he was one who was from the West. <clears throat> he was a lawyer and he, um, felt that they, uh, he could organize the grazing districts that the Taylor Grazing Act was uh, calling for. I mean, uh, now the, the grazing districts themselves, once they were organized, they had to, this was done locally. They would form grazing advisory boards uh, and decide I'll get into this in a little bit more detail. Who, who gets what and where, where do they get it? <clears throat> These advisory boards determine the boundaries of the grazing districts and were involved in the development of the federal range code. And the federal range code is, of course, the grazing regulations. Uh, the, the various advisory boards recommending establishing 50 districts covering 142 million acres and this was over the 80 million acre limit that the Taylor Grazing Act had originally um, set. Later, in 1936, the TGA was amended to allow for 142 million acres to be included in grazing districts. Now, up in Washington, there are BLM lands and there are BLM lands still, but there are no grazing districts. Um, as you can see here, there, it's not even on this map, um, but they are administered. The, if you're familiar with BLM, you'll hear the term section three grazing permits or section 15 grazing leases. Those refer to the different sections within the Taylor Grazing Act. Section three allows for issuing grazing permits. Section 15 allows for leasing lands that are outside grazing districts for the purposes of grazing. The last grazing district to form was the Battle Mountain Grazing District in 1956. And so this map of 1937 shows it not quite within grazing districts. <clears throat> These guys are uh, a, a pretty independent bunch down there and their ancestors uh, also were. And they figured if they didn't get into a grazing district then they wouldn't have to have 
any of these pesky federal grazing rules to, to deal with. That was one of their rationales for not forming a grazing district uh, until so late. <clears throat> the BLM was, uh, came to become a very decentralized uh, agency. That is, there, there was a lot of uh, what was called home rule on the range. Um, local uh, graziers, as they were called, regional graziers would consult with grazing advisory boards. And that was pretty much how the grazing districts were run. I don't have time to go into the, the politics right now, um, but these two, these two guys didn't get along. This was Hicks, Secretary Ickes under uh, 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 Roosevelt and uh, first director of grazing, Ferry Carpenter. So this is the Grazing Service Shield in 1939. Uh, BLM's grazing, it originally started as the Division of Grazing in the Bureau of Land Management, I mean, excuse me, in the Department of Interior. And then in 1939, it was reorganized into, well, it reorganized into the Grazing Service or around those times. So now we're coming up on how do we decide, how do the, what is the system for deciding who gets grazing permits? And the act calls for um, bonafide settlers, residents, and other stock owners who are citizens of the United States or have filed a declaration to become a citizen or groups, association, or corporations authorized to conduct business under the laws in the state in which the grazing district is located. So the initial um, Objective of grazing districts was to conserve the public domain as far as compatible therewith to promote the proper use of the privately controlled lands and waters dependent upon it. So the system that they came up with basically was attaching preference for grazing use to private properties. And that is still the system that is in use today. So if I want to get in on getting a public lands grazing permit, I'm either going to have to buy a ranch that has preference for grazing use on the public lands already attached to it, or negotiate with that rancher who has those lands, have them buy another piece of private property that could, and negotiate with a rancher to transfer the preference that they held on their property over to my property. That's, I don't know how to put it more simply. So this goes into how deciding how much to graze and the commensurability means that we're now to, we're to the era where ranchers are raising uh, uh, hay, they have private fields of their own, they have different ways of uh, feeding and caring for their livestock during that time that they're not on the public lands. And so you would have grazing districts that would say be a, a five seven district where you would the public lands would serve to support the cattle for seven uh, months and it was the, the base property and would be required to support it for five months. So this is how they uh, essentially divided up the range. And I don't want to get into the nitty gritty here because I don't think any of us on this call are going to be doing uh, preference transfers anytime soon. But in fact, the BLM at the, or the grazing service at this time, this is actually a Bureau of Land Management form. So this went on for quite a while, would go out to private ranches and uh, do estimates as to how much their uh, private land capacity was in order to get an idea for um, issuing them the, the uh, whether or not the amount they applied for on the public range was supportable. 
all of this also would also be run through uh, all of this. All of the calculations and the dis determinations would be approved generally by the grazing advisory board, which was a peer group of ranchers and we're, we're, who were elected by the ranchers themselves in the district. So initially carrying capacity was based on the applicant estimates. And then uh, in the forties, we had more, more formal surveys by federal range examiners. And at this point, um, I guess it was a lot of ocular estimation. Um, in the BLM, there's always going to be a controversy of the, the rancher comes, some ranchers come up and go, oh, well, I got my grazing rights. And a right is, is a very much different than a privilege or a preference. And it's very much legally different. Um, and so whether or not they're called rights or privileges, uh, and how are they recognized does have legal ramifications because uh, rights would implicate something like a takings. So if I was to were to uh, be a, a write a decision as a BLM manager, write a decision reducing your rights, uh, someone could say, well, you're, you're taking them for another public purpose. I want compensation for this. And the, the federal government is not, right now, that's not recognized as, it never was recognized as a grazing right, and it's not recognized as a right in the Taylor Grazing Act. They're called grazing, it's called a preference for grazing use, provided that you qualify, and um, the amount of use that you get are your grazing privileges. Now, when World War II hit, we had, uh, the, again, the, the, the conservation of the range took a back seat to um, producing food and fiber for the war effort. Um, and then the second part of this slide is, I just wanted to discuss a little bit about how much the new the grazing service depended on advisory boards uh, to be there. There, there just wasn't that many uh, grazing service folks in the first place to cover 142 million acres, and they uh, usually in, in the ranching communities. Some of the more influential would be located and would be turned in, you know, become elected to the grazing advisory board, and so forth and so on. And uh, well, you can read this, these advisory boards and the Taylor Grazing Act itself by requiring base property or, or, or the system that required a catching uh, preference for grazing use to privately owned property really had a, had a effect of um, getting rid of migrant, migrant sheep herds. I mean, there were some, and there still are some today, but they have base property like based in Utah. And they'll have uh, their, their preference for their permit in Utah, but they'll have a, a, a rotation that goes all the way from Northern Nevada, down the east side of the Sierra, over into the Bakersfield area, and back up through uh, Utah, as far as their, uh, uh, rotation of their of their sheep use. So these are vestiges of the migratory uh, uh, itinerant sheep man, as they were called. Right around this time, we start to get a sort of a new, starting to look at the environment in 1949. And this is just to, to illustrate that part of history that things are coming along. As far as things, uh, uh, the relationship to the land is being reevaluated. Uh, the grazing fee controversy is still a, a fee controversy, and uh, I don't think I really have time to go into it. It's its own little lecture in itself, and it's 
344 now. So this will have to be a two part talk. So this grazing fee controversy, however, um, led to um, gutting of the BLM in 1946 when there was a House committee that said the grazing services, the fees should go up and they should be sufficient to cover the agency's costs. The Senator McCarran of Nevada and their uh, appropriations committee were against this. And the Stockman's committee joint, like, um, excuse me, the Joint Livestock Committee on Public Lands, which were made of Stockman, sort of supported both. both. In the end, um, the Department of Interior was not able to change the fee from a nickel. And as a result, the appropriations, their appropriations were cut in half in 1947. And this decimated the staff from 250 to 40. And this was significant enough that the grazing advisory boards who had built up some range improvement funds, provided $200,000 in range improvement funds to shore up some of the staff of the agency back in the 50s. Now we come to the agency. Um, this was at the end of, well, in 1946, right after the war, the grazing service was then joined by, um, a, a reorganization, executive reorganization. There was no organic act like the Forest Service, you know, creating the Forest Service to, anyway, there was executive reorganization to make, to join the general land office with the United States Grazing Service. Now, the, the general land office goes back, as I said in my first slide, back to the get-go almost of the United States. And the General Land Office also had off, uh, um, arms of its that were, that would be handled, you know, minerals, the mining, realty, uh, revested ONC timberlands, and the grazing service dealt primarily with range management. But the, the BLM now is an amalgam of these two uh, agencies, and it's pretty much the growing pains are, are done and over with, but it's interesting to have, have, have understanding of the history of where, they, uh, uh, where it came from. And so this logo is, is pr pretty telling of uh, what the BLM thought of itself back in 1952. We have a surveyor, we have a timberman, we have a, a miner, we have a rancher, we have a, well, I don't, this is probably an oil guy and a miner. And the resources are out there for the taking. Um, in the 50s, we had range surveys disputes. Um, and I don't know, Tom, are you still there? I am, Ken. Should I, should I cut this off now? It's 348. You, you know, I think it might be a good time. It seems like a good place, uh, just as a BLM is forming, we're going to kind of get into a new uh, era of history. Why don't we pause now, take some questions and discussion, and we'll pick this up at another one of our presentations. Okay, so let's see. So I stopped sharing. Or are there any uh, questions? No, no. Yeah, let's, let's, let's handle some questions now. I don't have questions, but this is really a great history. And this is really interesting that would you be interested in speaking at the, uh, 2025? No, I don't think so, Andrea. I can't. I, <clears throat> this is actually kind of dicey doing it right here. Right? I I don't know that it's dicey, and it's I don't know that it's the public domain though. <laughs> oh, this is so interesting. I had no idea some of these things happen. Yeah, 
Um, yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I would have, I don't know who I'd have to talk to at this point. You know, like I would, I would feel like I'd have to sort of get permission. Well, it would be something uh, perhaps you'd uh, pursue, Ken, just to do some investigating for us. It would be a great topic. I have a question about the uh, public water uh, reserves. Yeah. Can you explain that? I, I had not heard of that. Um, well, um, out in the the there out in the um, big, big wide open, you know, you'll have springs, you'll have local areas that weren't patented, that weren't homesteaded. But, you know, I mean, there was no um, reason for that, but nonetheless, they were used for water by the, the point of public water reserves was, as I understand it, was that out in the big wide open, the local ranchers who were in the area would dominate these reserves. And so the poor little guy with his 10 cows for milk and you know a beef a year uh, would be told to go elsewhere or, or you know he would have his 40 acres and the rancher, you know, would have his, you know, 5,000 acres in the valley over and say, no, that's my water and fence it off and enforce that. That's so that was the history of that in the 1920s. So they found it necessary to say, no, these are water reserves for all the people to use, not just the ones that are um, dominant in the area. And is there any regulation on who can use that water and how much? Yeah, now you're getting outside my expertise. We have water water rights specialists in the BLM, and I would go to them to talk to what all is is allowed and not allowed on, on public water reserves. All right, so this water has been adjudicated in some manner. <clears throat> um, yes. Thank but, you. And it, I do know from listening to our hydrologists back in the day, though, that they, when you're talking about adjudication of the water or whether the basin was, you know, they do these adjudications and they take decades to complete that, you know, these water reserves do add a wrinkle to that um, state adjudication of water. And that, I guess, is another point about the federal public water reserves because water rights themselves are in the purview of the states. So that adds a little complication, you know, to the whole water situation. And also, I, and I want to just point out, as long as you're bringing up water, that in New Mexico and Arizona, there's not a whole lot of, the, the Taylor Grazing Act said, land or water or water rights. So in the Northern tier above the snow line, it's, it's land-based, reference below the snow line, there's not a whole lot of private land in the in the big wide open out in, in Arizona and, and uh, New Mexico, but there are water water rights. And so grazing uh, preference and permits are attached to, uh, you know, waters uh, out in the desert. And, and those are transferred uh, among private proper, private parties, just like land is up in the northern part. Are there more questions for Ken? Well, then I'll, I'll post, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, could you repeat what the source of the presentation was? You said it might not be part of the public domain. I was curious, who was the original person who put it together and, and brought it forward? Uh, me, when I worked for the BLM. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Okay, so it's you created right it, now the, intellectual the, property. The uh, well, and I'll, I'll tell you how it evolved. So the I I I, I moved to Washington D.C. in 1999. This is right when 
as a staffer on the Washington DC staff. This was right when the Supreme Court agreed to hear the case of uh, Public Lands Council versus Babbitt, which was the ranchers, we'll get to this in part two, <laughs> hopefully, the ranchers challenge to the range reform regulations of the 1990s. As part of this, the so who defends the United States government and suits the Justice Department? So we had, I was tasked as being an assistant to the Justice Department lawyers. They would have questions and, and find out this and give me answers to this, you know, pages of them. And so I had to do a lot of research uh, to answer their questions. And this um, sort of was an outgrowth of that research. I put it together in a slideshow and started presenting it because when I was a range con out in the field as a rookie, I would go, well, what is, what is this transfer stuff all about? Why, why do we do, it was basically, why are we doing what we're doing? How did this come about? So that's what this is leading to. So more recently, I, when I retired in 2016, oh, okay, let me get back to that. So we won the Supreme Court case 9-0. And now I had all this information. I put it together in a slideshow and they asked me to go out and help with teaching uh, beginning range cons, you know, sort of the, the, the foundation of all the administrative processes that they were uh, doing day to day in their jobs. And so I did this among other things at the, made this presentation among other things at the, range school for 15 years and then turned it over to another person who still works for BLM or at the uh, our National Service Center. His name is Bill Luchens and he asked me, he said he wanted to update it somewhat and asked me for input. And so I, I retained a copy after I retired. So I helped him with some of the some of the stuff he brought to the to the talk, and so it's still being taught in a probably a, in a more expanded form in our in our BDLM's range school in Phoenix, which typically occurs like right around now. <laughs> anyway, so because this is so has BLM footprints all over it, I would I would hesitate to, you know, they might say, well, this sounds like you're speaking for BLM, but you're retired. And so, so <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Okay, we'll investigate. What a good place to stop, Ken. It was a fascinating presentation. Um, and I look forward, I know we all look forward to part two, uh, which will schedule